Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you happen to be. So today, so I'm Stephen Gallagher. Uh, I'm a longtime Fedora uh, contributor and later uh, troublemaker. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Fedora ELN. Uh, or as I like to refer to it, uh, putting the relish on the beefy miracle. Uh, for those of you who have been around a while, you might remember uh, we had a Fedora release once uh, codenamed Beefy Miracle that was uh, absolutely not controversial at all. So moving ahead. First, we'll start with a little bit of history. Um, the idea behind Fedora ELN originally sprang from uh, the RHEL 8 bootstrap. When we were, when we were uh, taking Fedora and turning it into uh, the, the beginnings of what would be RHEL 8, um, it took over a year of, uh, of you know, cloning the branches, build, uh, building the packages, figuring out that the, uh, that they no longer, which things no longer built because they built okay with the pre with a previous set of dependencies and ran on fine on a new set of dependencies, but they couldn't build with the new one and so on and so forth. And, oh, this, this package, ha uh, you know, in Fedora, we run, uh, you know, we turn on every experimental flag in the configure uh, script because, Hey, it's Fedora. Got to try, try things out. Whereas in, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, maybe we only want to stick with the production quality uh, features. And that can, that can result in lots and lots of uh, additional dependencies. So we have to also trim those out. Um, and in particular, uh, my uh, if you've ever heard me give a talk before, I'm not a huge fan of uh, Sphinx, if only because it pulls in something like 25% uh, of all the packages in the Fedora distro just to uh, Handle writing, uh, handle writing docs, uh, because uh, we have all the flags turned on. That that sort of stuff uh, takes a lot of time to work through, and well, then Red Hat went ahead and announced that uh, at the at the release of Rel Eight, that from then on we were going to be having three year Rel releases. And myself and other members of the bakery team collectively uh, turned and looked at each other and said, well, that's going to be fun. Because, of course, we can't, if we're going to be releasing every three years, we can't be spending more than a year every time just getting the, getting the uh, bootstrap into position for people to do development on. We can't, realistically, that would lead to something like a year, maybe a year and a half worth of actual development time, which is absolutely not going to be enough for a rel release. So what did we do? Well, we realized that oh yeah, Fedora exists. What can we how can we take advantage of our good relationship with Fedora? Uh, actually I, mean, I want to rephrase that cuz it sounds like I'm <laughs> it sounds like I'm abusing that relationship, but uh, what uh, what we decided to do was see if we could spin up a version of Fedora that was designed specifically around looking like RHEL so that we could uh, get a lot of this bootstrapping done in a rolling way from uh, right from the moment that uh, we fork from the previous uh, Fedora uh, for RHEL. So Fedora ELN was born. Now, where does Fedora ELN come from? Well, ELN comes from Rawhide. What we do is we take rawhide and the, the rawhide disk git. We select we have a selection of packages that we know that are going that we want to have in rel plus their dependencies and build dependencies. We and we set up an automatic rebuild system that will go ahead and uh, build all those packages with rel rpm macros, rel's compiler flags, which uh, which affects things like uh, performance tweaks and which uh, hardware is supported. Um, and uh, in general, we just try to make it, we, we try to make the build process as close to what we would do for Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS Stream as possible. So that we can, so we can see much, much earlier on which things are going to give us problems uh, if we try to, when we try to rebuild them for RHEL. 
So how exactly do we go about doing this? There are three main tools uh, that ELN uh, is using today that uh, to make this all come together. The first of those is the content resolver, uh, written and primarily maintained by uh, Adam Samalik, also at Red Hat, which is a real, which was designed for the uh, the Fedora minimization effort initially, and it's a great, great way to visualize how what things are in your distribution, what things you don't want to be there for in the case of rel you know there are not plenty of p packages that we don't want to support so we want to know what is causing those to be pulled in um, and generally uh, provides us with a really great way to uh, search and examine the uh, dependency trees in the uh, in uh, fedora and rel we uh, used this to great effect uh, when boots when uh, putting together rel 9 uh, as it also can do uh, do some interesting uh, heuristic things like figuring out uh, which who should which group should own which package in rel because well they're the only ones that have that are pulling it in if they don't want to own it they have to figure out a way not to depend on it and so on and so forth so from the content resolver, we also we get a we get lists and, and JSON uh, data and whatnot that allows us to figure out what packages do we actually want to be in ELN or ultimately in RHEL ten, and then examine those and go through go through. So we take one of those static files generated by content resolver, and we feed it into a tool that uh, I build and built and maintain called the Distro Build Sync. Uh, it's a broken out part of what was once called the distro baker. Its uh, purpose is it, it, it behaves uh, similarly to how uh, Koji Shadow used to. If anybody remembers the, the dark times before we had merged the uh, secondary architectures into the main Koji, in that uh, whenever it detects a, a package being tagged into the current rawhide branch, which right now is F37. Oh, sorry, current rawhide tag in Koji. It then goes ahead and rebuilds that package from uh, uh, against the ELN target with the ELN build tags and target and compiler flags and so on. Uh, once we have those builds, uh, once a day or sometimes more often, if I'm uh, hacking on it, we use uh, the Pungi tool written by uh, the Fedora release engineering team. This allow this uh, is a very complicated tool that is mostly that mostly just uh, gathers up other uh, other tools that we have like uh, Lorax and Anaconda and Image Builder, OS Build, uh, and a variety and a variety of other tools. And it is essentially the sausage machine. It's the it is the thing that grinds all of those uh, individual builds that we've done in Koji and then takes them in and turns them into repositories for updates or an install, install media, boot, boot ISOs, USB ISOs, VM, uh, you know, virtual machine images, uh, and container images. So that's where, uh, so the ELN Compose is pretty much the main output uh, location for what you're uh, for uh, what you see in ELN. It's where we. It's where you, as an individual, can consume and t and try out and test this, uh, this stuff. And also, you can see whether or not and if you've been going ahead and making changes to the content to try and reduce the dependencies. It's, uh, it's where you'll see the uh, the fruits of your labor. And then, of course, this uh, whole process is uh, cyclical because once we have these repositories generated by Pungi, the content resolver can get, then go and reanalyze them and figure out, oh, hey, we no longer need these this stuff. And Distro Build Sync, as part of one of its uh, various tools, uh, sub-tools, will also go and untag stuff that is no longer in the uh, required uh, package set. So then it gets back to Pungi and, hey, no, uh, no package, uh, that package is gone again. Our goal, of course, is to minimize the amount of unnecessary dependencies without uh, minimizing, without reducing fun functionality in a, in a significant way. But uh, yeah, so I actually had, uh, I wrote this slide uh, 
today based on a conversation that I had, uh, I think, uh, I'd have to double check. I think it might have been with uh, uh, Fabiano in uh, Fedora Devel the other day. And I realized we didn't, uh, we didn't actually have a good overview of how th the actual process works. And so I'm going to have to put together a document or maybe a blog post on, on how all these things fit together. But I thought it would be a useful place uh, here in this talk to, to just walk through those three big steps and see where, and uh, give people an idea. So um, has ELN been successful? I think so. Um, I, we, in RHEL 9, when we bootstrapped RHEL 9, we were able to take advantage of ELN and we bootstrapped it by way of CentOS Stream 9. So both of those worked and both of those worked considerably faster than they had when we were bootstrapping rel eight by hand. Uh, I think, I think we had, com we had committed to uh, five months and got it done in three and a half. If I'm remembering correctly, it may have been, it may have been four months, but either way, we actually uh, managed to outperform and deliver uh our uh, bootstrap to the to engineering ahead of schedule, which that's not a thing you get to say very often. So I'm going to say that as often as I can until we get to rel 10 and hopefully get to start saying how we did better in rel 10 than in rel nine. So what are we going to do next? Well, ELN, much like rawhide never stops. Uh, when, once, uh, we've got a few more releases of Fedora until we get to the uh, point where we're going to split off for CentOS Stream and RHEL 10. But at that point, at the moment when we split uh, Fedora 40 off into its own uh, fi you know, finalizing uh, branch, on that same day, at that same time, RHEL, uh, uh, Fedora ELN will suddenly start targeting RHEL 11 instead of RHEL 10. Uh, at that point, we will we will also use that point to start to to switch the bootstrap over to CentOS Stream and get the, and as ten and get that running. So it's going to be that's that's going to be a pretty exciting day. I'm looking forward to hopefully it be running smoother than uh, Rel nine, and it can't possibly run any less smooth than Rel eight. So that's going to be exciting. A couple of things that are on the uh, the fairly near horizon. Uh, we've been talking with uh, with some of the uh, the tools team, uh, the compiler team, and so on, and uh, as well as Red Hat uh, product management. There's a, there while not yet finalized, there are expectations that we may have to that we may up, uh, increase the uh, CPU baseline for some of the uh, architectures that Rel supports. Uh, to, to gain uh, to take advantage of some performance gains and uh, and also some partner uh, partner uh, advantages if we uh, by making sure that people are using recent hardware so that's that's a bit controversial it didn't, um, it was proposed once previously and uh, declined on the grounds that uh, some of the people uh, some of the people working with ELN didn't have hardware that would meet it it would match. And while that is a concern, uh, it's not like Rawhide won't exist forever. So I think we're probably going to uh, approach you know, the ELN SIG about uh, taking a look at that for the uh, for the ZStream and for the and for uh, the uh, x86 architecture as well uh, in the relatively near future. So I've used about half of my time for t uh, uh, talking at you, uh, but I wanted to leave most. Well, the other half of the time uh, to answer any questions that folks have about ELN. So, I would like to I'll start with uh, looking at the Q and A. And now I haven't been looking, following the chat or Q and A this whole time. Uh, okay, I've got an anonymous question: Does ELN stand for Enterprise Linux Next? And I suspect I may know who this is coming from because they want me to tell the story about uh, behind the ELN naming. So today, we it does mean Enterprise Linux Next. It was originally a it, it was originally a, a code name that I had come, come up with, which was El Nino, which of course uh, w which was a combination of uh, a variety of of different puns to make up one big pun. 
uh, L, of course, being uh, the Spanish word for the, but also uh, uh, commonly used to represent enterprise Linux. Uh, N, uh, the, the uh, Nino, of course, is that uh, ELN was meant to be the child that grew up into uh, enterprise Linux. And lastly, because uh, El Nino is a uh, weather phenomenon that comes around about every three years and uh, tends to leave a mess behind it. <laughs> so I think that should be fairly self-explanatory. Uh, ELN, does ELN have a logo? Um, it, we do. Uh, it's a, uh, I didn't put it in my slides. Uh, I don't know why I didn't put it in my slides. But you can find it uh, on the uh, uh, Fedora uh, wiki for ELN, I believe. Uh, it it also is a bit of a pun uh, on the t the title of this uh, th this uh, talk. Uh, it is a jar. It is three jars of condiments, each with the uh, with one of the letters on it, uh, to imply the relish. <laughs> um, all right, Alexander, uh, ELN rebuilds seem to fail for packages that need to preserve a build order for ABI changes. Is there a plan to have that? Uh, that should not still be happening, uh, at least in theory. There may be some special cases, but for the most part, what we what we switch to doing for the rebuilds is first the first thing we do is we tag whenever things are tagged into Rawhide. We tag those same things into ELN and regenerate the build root before we start a build. That way, our assumption is we should, uh, since presumably all of the uh, build order stuff has been taken care of in that in the a side tag prior to when we merge it, we we assume that by using the finalized versions of those packages, uh, we should be able to build against those against the Fedora ones to build the ELN ones. Uh, there are some few special cases that I know of that, for which this doesn't work. Uh, Alexander, if you happen to know any in particular that uh, we aren't catching, uh, I'd uh, appreciate a, a, a bug ticket, a ticket or a, a conversation to let me know what it is because uh, I haven't caught it yet. But uh, thank you for asking that. I hope I hope this isn't hasn't been nearly as much of a problem over the last uh, six months or so because that's uh, that's about when we implemented the uh, the new approach. How much effort is keeping ELN going, for example, when builds fail? Um, you may recall that at last nest I had hair. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, no, kidding aside, it's, for the most part, it's background uh, effort. It's Generally, uh, we, I, I, I generally only jump in and try to deal with uh, issues that have caused the uh, compose process to fail, uh, because generally, even if the uh, ELN builds fail, we most of the time have those Fedora versions that have been tagged in that allow us to keep things up uh, and running. So, the so in general, the system, the EL, ELN tends to stay usable, except for when those occasions when we've somehow broken the compose, like. Yeah, we've or we've broken the build root for the build, uh, for other builds. Um, it's, I, I would say it's probably taking up, but depending on the day, between uh, twenty five and fifty percent of my time at this point. Uh, few uh, less when uh, others are available to assist, of course. Uh, Petter, those weird. Disk tags surely are confusing. Can you explain why they are the way they are? Um, I might need a little more explanation as to what uh, confuse what what, me, uh, what confusing means here. Uh, we oh, uh, do you mean? I, I'm not sure if you mean the uh, the numbers following ELN. You know, like right like right now we're at ELN 121, um, and if the, if those are what you mean. It, there are two reasons for that. Uh, we started them at number one, at the number 100 first uh, so that we would be very clear that it did not correspond to a Fedora release or a RHEL release or a CentOS release, et cetera, that it was expressly a different uh, meaning because we didn't want people seeing EL10 because it happened to be uh, uh, 10 or ELN10 and thinking it meant Enterprise Linux 10. 
so we use uh, we started them at 100, and those essentially represent uh, build root configurations. So anytime we make a change to the build root configuration, I bump th that uh, number so that we can cleanly do rebuilds without having without requiring uh, that we bump uh, that we bump the release of every individual package to do so. One of the uh, one of the promises we made when we started on uh, started landing Fedora ELN in the Fedora project was that we would try not to interfere with existing packaging work as much as possible. Uh, we didn't want we we didn't want uh, Bodhi updates to be gated on ELN ELN working. We didn't want co uh, builds being gated. You know, the build process requiring ELN to succeed in order for Fedora to continue working. So. So, so some of this uh, was just a uh, conven planned convenience on our part to make sure that we would be able to do as many rebuilds as strictly necessary if we had to do a series of them without uh, without with, without the uh, mess of filling up the uh, get uh, the git history I hope that answers your question but if it doesn't please ask another one <laughs> are you looking for contributions to eln if so, what kind of contributions or activities would be helpful? Well, yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, for anyone who is interested, uh, for, first of all, if you're a packager, we would love it if you actually uh, paid attention to and took care of uh, the ELN side of your builds. Uh, I know that a number of uh, a number of you out there, probably some people on this uh, listening to this uh, talk, are already doing that. Uh, you know, and but a lot of people pr are probably just paying paying attention to their Fedora packages. And great, if you're not interested, you don't need to be interested. We uh, we try to cover for that. But what we would love to see is, and and what we're trying to do in inside of Red Hat, and I would like to expand out to Fedora more, is if you would be willing to uh, to start doing some of that minimization some of that trimming of experimental stuff uh, a lot of people a lot of packages out there already uh, conditionalize for uh, rel in the in terms of uh, building for apple and similar what we would like to s love to see is more of that uh, planning for uh, el NAC, el n plus one as, as well and so that can easily be tested uh, done and tested in ELN, and I'd appreciate a lot of that. For other things, um, we could use some people who are uh, willing to be more vocal and help us uh, help us communicate our uh, efforts and our plans out to the wider Fedora community a little bit more. Because uh, I am only one man, and I can either be very, very visible. Or I can be very, very productive, but I can't do both at the same time usually. So I uh, would love to have somebody along that would be uh, help, uh, would be willing to help answer some of the questions that we get asked and help and to just uh, help us produce some really decent documentation as well. Um, thank you for that question, Josh. Uh, I've got time for a couple more. If somebody wanted to create a La Nina version of ELN that had a different set of flags and packages, what would it take to do that? Um, that uh, is possible. Uh, like I said in my previous answer, I think we would uh, definitely benefit from some uh, some engineering or so, some documentation help. Uh, I would love to try and knowledge dump what I've learned about the compose process uh, to some to someone new, and we could. No, with what we know now about how we created ELN, it would probably be possible to create uh, other similar diver uh, divergent OSs from Fed uh, from Fedora. Although, uh, and I'm sure Matthew is going to appreciate this, I would prefer if, for the most part, we only did that when we had a very strong reason to do so. You know, ELN exists because we want to make sure that Fedora still uh, Fedora serves the uh, its its purpose of uh, helping to um, I don't want to say bootstrap here because I've said that word too many times, but uh, rel. And so incubate rel. There we go. Uh, if, if we wanted, if we were going to create another, uh, a La Nina, for example, it would, it, it, it would be a, a fairly considerable effort, but 
a lot of, but a lot of that would be following us. It would, it would ultimately be just repeating the effort we took for ELM. So, do you know whether Rust library packages will stay in ELN, or if those should be trimmed down by building against vendor dependencies where needed? As far as I know, there are no Rust package maintainers on the rel side. Sorry if this question is too specific. <laughs> no problem if you don't have an answer right now. So. I think uh, I think our goal is absolutely to uh, minimize our set of dependencies. And Rust is Rust has a really complicated build system, uh, build setup in in Fedora. And I'll be honest, I do not understand how it works. Uh, it is a mystery to me entirely. Uh, so, I guess the answer really is, excuse me, if you were to speak to uh, if you would go go in the content resolver and take a look at what was pulling uh, those Rust packages in, I would have a conversation with uh, whatever pa whatever packages are at the top of that uh, wanted list, and see, you know, do they really want this here? And if so, can they help uh, maintain it in Fedora with wh whether that means vendoring it or taking ownership of a you know a dozen or so Rust packages? Uh, somebody needs to uh, be willing to take ownership of that. Uh, whom to contact to be an ELN packager. Uh, there are no special requirements to package for ELN. Uh, you are all, if you are packaging anything for Rawhide that is, t that is on the list of things that will be, be, be in ELN, you're already a packager for ELN. Um, if, you want to look, if you want to package some additional software that uh, won't go into Red Hat Enterprise Linux, but uh, might go into something like Apple when the next version of Apple is released, then we have a tool called we we have a we have a, a sub project called ELN Extras, which is for better uh, for lack of a better term, and I know Troy will uh, correct me in the comments. Uh, it's essentially a preview release of Apple for Apple currently for Apple Ten, and if you want to work there, what you uh, you can contact us. We ha we have to write up a, pr a process document for this, but ultimately it boils down to. Add your package to the content resolver uh, ELN extras list. Let the content resolver regenerate, and it'll just start automatically rebuilding rawhide pa that rawhide package into the ELN extras uh, repository. I hope that answered your question. And I think I've gotten through all of the questions in the Q and A. Um, if any, if there were any asked in the chat, I have not had a chance to uh, review that at all. So, if you, if any, if there are any unanswered questions in the chat, if somebody could uh, replicate them to the Q and A section, I'd appreciate it. All right. Well, uh, thank you everyone uh, for participating in this, and I hope I was able to uh, enlighten you a little bit about ELN. So, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of Nest.